Super producer Anthony Haney dancing his face off. I'm merely Craig Hoffman, host of the show, sitting in the chair very calmly. Uh, so the Washington Wizards season is over, which honestly, Ant, yay! Normally that's a boo, we want more basketball. I think for this season's Wizards, everyone has had enough. Uh, Denny Avia had a, a, a post that started with like a black and white photo and you're like, yeah, that's the kind of season it was. Kyle Kuzma's on Twitter asking for uh, brunch recommendations. He's going to be spending more time in D.C. this offseason. Uh, so he's like, I need to know where to go for brunch. So look for a very, very tall man at your local brunch spot. A um, couple of good recommendations. I, I did favorite that post because I'm like, where's everyone else going for brunch? I got to make sure I don't I don't lose out on any recommendations. Uh, but and uh, we have we have burning questions, non brunch affiliated uh, to answer uh, in terms of the wizard season. Where would you like to start uh, producer of this show? I think we can start, you know, simple. What would you say was your biggest takeaway from uh, the season that was? My biggest takeaway from the season that was for the Wizards is that they are farther away than I thought, which is saying something because I thought they were pretty far away. But I also thought that they would... I mean, look, I have to own it. One of the worst predictions I've ever said was that the Wizards would cruise past their over on the Vegas win total this year. I mean, Jordan Poole's numbers compared to what Bradley Beals were the last couple of seasons were pretty comparable. And so I'm like... Well, they'll at least win like 35. That's kind of what they've been. Um, obviously, Porzingis was a huge factor in their success last year. But Kuz and Poole, like guys like Kisper, Denny, Dakin Steps, like they got enough to win 35 games. Like they're not going to be good, but they're not going to be terrible. And very quickly, you find out that they were terrible. I still think it's weird because I actually don't know how bad they are, in part because they're extraordinarily terrible stretch, a.k.a. the first 50 games of the season uh, w- between Wes Unseld and some confounding coaching stuff and the biggest factor being Jordan Poole's incredibly lackluster play. Well, if if Jordan is the guy that we saw the last month and a half of the season, like they're in, they're not as far as they looked in January. I'll put it that way. But clearly, I think the biggest takeaway for anybody coming out of the season has to be that they are simply farther away from forget contention from like playoff contention than we thought coming into the year would you say like two maybe three years i mean i think it depends on what they do this offseason right like if all of a sudden koulibaly makes the french team or doesn't and but has a productive summer right his goal is to make the front the french national team he would then play in the olympics at home in paris which would be awesome for him it'd be a great experience i think that french team can compete for a medal for sure obviously you got gobert Wemby, like bilal like that's a pretty nasty team Mm -hmm. uh as well as some others um, you like does Tony Parker be like? I think I have a little more basketball left in me. I would like a medal. Um, you know they've got other guys though that are that are good and um, are going to help them compete with the U.S. and Spain and and Argentina and some of the other powers in in global basketball. But um, or he goes to summer league and hopefully he has one of those like okay you're going to play three games and dominate everybody and then shut it down because you're clearly better than all the rest of these dudes here. So you got you got that with Bilal. Um, Denny continued to grow throughout the year. And by the end of it, like he's a, he's a bona fide NBA starter. Kuz talked today about he's got to come back in better shape. Like he thought he was ready to go. And then you realize the burden night to night of being the guy comes with a even different level of conditioning than being in good NBA shape. And there were times that year this year where he got sloppy late in games and that comes from fatigue. So he, his understanding of that, I think, is a great sign that he's going to come back better next year. And then the biggest factor is, like, what is Jordan Poole and what do they do around those guys? Like, do you wind up signing and trading Tyus Jones or you try to run back a Jones-Poole backcourt that makes absolutely no sense, even if I like both players individually? So I think those, like, they could be in the playoffs next year. Mm. I don't think that they will, and I think that's a conscious choice to keep an eye on the long term and not try to shortcut it and sign some guys that could help them make the playoffs next year when they're not really a part of the long term plan. Nah, for sure, for sure. And you you talked about Koulibaly, um, and the growth that he's had this season. Who 
would you say, you know, also took some steps in the right direction or are just like overall bright spots, you know, following this season that we had? So Koulibaly is undoubtedly the biggest bright spot, right? He was so much better than everyone thought he would be. People thought he was going to split the year between the G League and, and the regular Wizards because he had barely played top French level basketball. Like this is a dude that, you know, when we're talking in January and talking about how well he's doing with the phrase a year ago, he was in the French second division was a true statement. It wasn't until late in last season that he got up on the team that Wemby was on over in France in the first division. He was a second division French teenager who then was able to get as an 18 year old onto that first division team. And then all of a sudden was in the NBA and playing like real NBA defense and attacking closeouts and making threes at a clip that nobody saw coming. So the, how advanced he is already is the biggest bright spot where you're like, oh, I wonder if they got one of their three stars, like maybe even the second. It feels unlikely he's the first, but crazier things have happened. The crazier thing that has happened is uh, Giannis Adetokounmpo exists. Um, but, like, are you talking about a Giannis-y type of trajectory here where all of a sudden we're looking up in two years being like, oh my God, this guy's a, an all-star. I think it's not a realm of possibility, although I think he probably winds up just below it unless he hits another growth spurt. So Koulibaly is undoubtedly bright spot one. As weird as this is to say, I think the other most significant bright spot in the season is Poole didn't tank until the end. We're going to talk about disappointment, so we'll save more on pool for a second. But the fact that he didn't finish like he started and he had a 20-plus point, 8-plus assist month and a half to end the season, that's important. Um, other than that, Kispert, big, big positive year. Avdia, I think, had a really, really, really good year. And the other guy that I'll throw out, like those guys were kind of did the thing that we would ho we hope they would do, like continue to grow into bigger roles. I don't think they're stars. Maybe they're starters. I think on a championship team, if they're your sixth and seventh guys, like you're in amazing shape. But either one of them could could be a spot starter or a regular starter with the right people around them. I think one of the best moves they made this year is getting Marvin Bagley. He like they played the first part of the year without a functional big man in the lineup um, in the ways that they needed. Gafford was good, but he was hurt a lot. And and once Bagley got here, and the thing is like, actually, I shouldn't even say that about Gaff. Gaff was actually really good for the time that he was here. He was probably the best player in the first 50 games of the season, uh, not named Kyle Kuzma. But they had no depth. And so there was like two weeks where Bags and uh, Gafford were here together. And they like had a respectable two weeks because they actually had, proper big man depth and then there's was like five games it felt like where Bagley and Rashawn Holmes were healthy and they like did okay in those games so uh, you know you look at the roster construction and you go okay if Holmes is a good player which he looks like he might be and Bagley's a good player which he might be you're actually not as far up the creek as you thought you just got to find a ways to to send those guys home for the summer with a plan to get them through next year healthy um, because they're they are potentially NBA starting caliber bigs or really good bench bigs. Um, but then the question is obviously like, what do you do around them? Um, and that gets into the, the, the art, how far are you question? Yeah, I definitely love uh, the Marvin Bagley edition. Also, I like the kid Tristan Vucevic when Dude. he did play. Yeah. I, th I think he was definitely a, a bit of a bright spot to me because we finally got to see him play. We took him in a, uh, the second round and he's a real NBA player in limited minutes. If you like, get a real NBA player productive. in the second round, you've won. Like that is the nature of those. Like, mm -hmm. sure. The real winning is getting Draymond green. Who's going to the hall of fame. Like that's yeah. sick. Um, I, Vukovic is not going to go to the hall of fame. It does. I, I doubt. I mean, who knows? I'm not going to write the kid off, uh, because he, he played like five games this year. Mm -hmm. Um, but he played and he was good. Like he can play in the NBA now. And now he's going to go to summer league and, you know, do go through his offseason, like understanding, like I'm really happy they got him that taste yep. because now he knows what he's got to do. And if he can add some size and some bulk and, you know, some skills to, or like polish the skills that he knows are going to make him really good. Like that's a potential future starter right there. Um, so that was a hell of a pick um, who's paying off. So like, I will say this, 
you know, Dawkins and, and Winger come from that OKC thing or that OKC program where they just figure out how to draft the right dudes all the time. Their two draft picks, like say what you want about pool, say what you want about any other acquisition or trade or whatever they made. They got two draft picks so far as the head of the Wizards. One of them's Koulibaly and the other's this Vukovic kid. And uh, I have that so far as a very significant two for two. Yeah. And we'll see. I mean, another bright spot could be the, uh, the draft lottery if they can win that. And then we'll see what they do with that pick. Uh, it's the Hoffman Show. We're on the Team 980. We're always live as well on the free Odyssey app. Uh, we'll take some calls on the Wizards next. Plus, uh, that, was, that was a very positive Wizards segment. It, it, it's just kind of how our questions fell. We saved a little extra time for some of the disappointments. So we'll get into what went so horribly wrong next. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and always live on the free Odyssey app. Uh, we're talking about the Washington Wizards. Uh, we'll talk WNBA draft coming up at the top of the hour. Who are the Mystics eyeing at six? And just how hard is the transition going to be, even for Caitlin Clark, uh, arguably the best player in the history of the college game, certainly uh, the best of modern times at that guard position. But how hard is the transition to the W game? Sabrina Merchant of The Athletic has written about both of those things, and she will join us at 6 p.m. Uh, but Anthony, uh, we had we we got the positives out of the way. Uh, we talked about the bright spots. We talked about how close are they, and had a realistic discussion. What's your next question about the Wizards? Oh my gosh, Craig! Uh, they uh, finished their season yesterday with the NBA's second worst record. Yikes. Yes, you got to start with the good, and then end with the bad. Okay. And here, I'm here to ask you, what were the biggest disappointments? from the season this year. And don't forget the what's until firing as well. Yeah, was- I, I would say I have two major okay. disappointments. Um, one is the coaching job that Wes Unsell did. I guess, well, that is multi-tiered. And so I'll save that one for a second. The first is, just, it's related to that, is, is Jordan Poole. I mean, and it's not so much like you're disappointed in Jordan as a person, because I understand that that guy worked his tail off all year and that we saw results at the end, that that wasn't lip service from everybody over at the Wizards who, no matter who you asked over there, would tell you, he's a great kid, he's working hard, we're really hoping that it turns around for him. He put in the work, and the last you know, quarter of the season, he got... Terrific results, solid shooting percentages, twenty three uh, or twenty two. I think wound up being the, the number ish points per game. Um, you know the free throw shooting came back. He was ninety plus percent from the line during that stretch, which was like another awkward, weird thing that he like wasn't hitting free throws. Like this dude would take technicals over Steph Curry in Golden State. He was that good of a free throw shooter. Um, and so, like, to to know that that he put in the work is great, but you still have to go. He played like 50 plus games of pretty terrible basketball, which again, I don't say as a shot at him personally. I mean to just give you the raw analysis of, oh my God, that was awful basketball from the missed shots to the turnovers to the just incomprehensibly bad defense. And I remember and we were talking about it in the middle of the season on the show. And, and the question I would ask, and you know, I don't think there is a good answer here, is if I'm Jordan Poole, watching Jordan Poole on tape play defense, do I think that I'm doing a good job? Because there were just times where you're like, that's not good enough from an effort standpoint. That's not good enough from a technique standpoint. Like, you have got to be able to make it at least... Like, at least don't, if you give up a drive, don't give up a straight line drive. Like, just be a bit of a nuisance. Pretend, make the offensive player pretend like you are there, like you exist. And I think that then folds into the coaching part of it. I don't, I like Wes Unsell Jr. personally a lot. I think he's a very smart basketball mind. I said all this stuff when he got fired. But he did a just a ridiculously bad job this year. And I know there's one thing to say, like he, they weren't trying to win, but 
ultimately his job is to try to win. And that involves not only strategy and mixing up defenses and, and doing some things, but it requires one, first and foremost, the thing that he got fired for was a lack of accountability. And guys like Poole, who were not playing up to their level, not for not for shots not going in or, you know, I do think it took Jordan a long time to you kind of cope with the, the trade and how everything went down with the punch and Golden State, like all that stuff. Like, I just think as a human being, I have, I have such a high level of empathy for Poole, especially seeing how it ended. We were like, no, nah, like, he still got it in there, and he was working through it, right? So, but beyond that, like, there just wasn't a level of accountability for bad play, bad decisions, poor performances. And, and the, the uh, symptom of that was nothing ever changed. No lineup changes, no nothing outside of injuries. And the rotation stayed the same. And it's just like, hey, this is a season where you're trying to you're trying to try stuff. And that's why I was so happy to hear Will Dawkins when they moved on from Unselled say, like, we're now in kind of experimentation season. And Brian Keefe is gonna try a bunch of stuff. And they they tried different defenses, they tried different offensive strategies and roles and put the ball in different guys' hands. And ultimately they put the ball in Jordan's hands, and it's like, duh. Uh, my God, you play the point guard at point guard and he produces like he used to at, you know, point guard. Um, and and so I think that just the incredibly poor, like, inex- and, and I'll even use this word. This is the word I think I like the most for it, Anthony, is it's an inexplicably bad job by Wes Unseld over the first 50 plus games. And I say inexplicably out of respect for Wes He's too smart and too good of a person and cares too much and like is too thoughtful and too well-respected to do the job that he did. It made no sense. And that stacked loss after loss after loss. And I give a lot of people around the organization credit for keeping it together. Um, and then ultimately Winger for making the move uh, and Dawkins for making the move. And Brian Keefe, I don't know that he's... It's one of the things I want to find out this week on the show is we'll have some guests on to, to talk about it. Like is Brian should Brian Keith be in consideration for this job considering he only won, you know, eight games. Uh I think they were eight and thirty one in his thirty nine games, but they were definitely more competitive. They definitely played smarter basketball and it, they were hurt for a lot of that. And so it just comes down to the talent deficit. They got beat by better teams on a consistent basis, uh, but at least they competed. And so I, I think when you look at the disappointments, it's Pool's performance in a vacuum, and then the decision making and the lineups and and all of the coaching job that it was inexplicably bad from Unselled that leads you to having the second worst record in the league. Those to me are the two like outstanding disappointments. Yeah, and I think on the coaching front, the accountability the accountability piece, I think that was the biggest part, just because guys aren't being held accountable. They're just going to, you know, keep doing the same thing over and over again, and it's going to continue to result in loss after loss after loss. And eventually you end up being that team that you tweeted out that you didn't want to end up being that team. So, yeah, uh, what a season, man. <laughs> what a season. Can I do one more um, disappointment? And this is going to be a bit of a, a wacky, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> sure. Um. As media members, one of the things that you strive to get is access, right? Like, it's really nice when a team is like, yeah, come in or we'll tell you this thing. And specifically, there's a kind of access you get as a features reporter that is that is different and special. And when it's done right, you have no idea the reporter's there until the thing comes out, and then the reporter can play, paints a complete picture of the time that they spent with the subject, period, right? And so the best example of this in recent uh, journalism is Wright Thompson's piece on Caitlin Clark. It is unbelievable journalism from like an... He got access to her for a lot of the year. He was able to stop in and out uh, of the Iowa program, the coaches talked to him. He got to go to like Caitlin's birthday dinner with her parents. Like there was a ton of access. And the story that Wright Thompson wrote was unbelievably good. It is so worth your time if you haven't seen it yet. Then there's whatever the ESPN reporter did with the Wizards. 
He got eight days of full access. He got to go to work with Michael Winger, someone that we've been trying. This is not a shot at the Wizards. Like, Winger's trying to hang back. I get it. We we're hoping to have either Michael or Will later on in the week. Um, but, like, we, we would love to have, um, you know, Michael Winger on and to be able to ask questions and to, to get to go behind the scenes and practice and all of these kinds of things, to get the kinds of access that this feature reporter uh, did at uh, er, with the Wizards. And he published a story last week that basically hadn't been updated since like February 15th. You know, we talked to, like, there was just this unbelievable, like, downtrodden version of Jordan Poole that was maybe accurate when the story was reported in late January, right before Unselt was fired. And there were some interesting tidbits and, like, there was some good stuff in there. But it just ignored the fact that the last month and a half existed where, like, Poole turned it around and was scoring 23 to 25 a night and eight assists and his turnovers were down and the shot selection was better and the the Wizards were competing and the vibe around the team was different. Like, it just ignored all of that. And it was freaking weird, man. So, yeah, that's that's not to, like, defend the Wizards or anything. Nobody asked me to do that. Um, I just, like, I read that story and was like, what the bleep is this? This is a stupid use of really valuable real estate given to a reporter who just totally screwed it up. So yeah, that was my other disappointment. I thought when I saw the headline, we were going to get a really cool insight into the wizards. And instead we got one that was two and a half months old. Not for you on that one. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> What's up kiddos. It's your boy Clinton Yates from ESPN. Yeah! The Hoffman Show on the Team 9-8. Tell your mama I said what's up.